Let's start with the introduction, Ra. Do the introduction. Um, so, um, hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining in for this lecture. Uh, just to give you guys a brief, we're going to be talking about collider mechanics, uh, specifically in uh, uh, one second. Specifically in, uh, you know, in particle colliders. Uh, what we'll see today is uh, we'll basically go into the electronics, uh, the simple physics as in terms of uh, coordinates, uh, what happens before collision, uh, what happens during collisions and what do we do after uh, collisions? Just a brief uh, uh, overview of all of these uh, different aspects of, uh, you know, high energy physics uh, colliders. So uh, I'll hand it over to Amaraj uh, to begin uh, talking about particle acceleration. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, unlike our last on fully about theory and uh, I'm going to give a little story about how all this happens okay first let's start with uh, before collision before collision we need to accelerate the particles right uh, what particles are we accelerating after photons and electrons protons are probably the easiest particles to isolate and create a beam of protons are just atomic hydrogen nuclei so to get a proton, you just need to ionize hydrogen, which means uh, rip the electron apart from the orbit, you get a proton, that's it. It is done by taking hydrogen gas and putting it in a strong electric field. In this electric field, the electron and proton are pulled apart. Once hydrogen is broken up, we can use electric and magnetic fields to do whatever we want with the protons. Uh, after isolating the protons, the LHC manipulates the proton bunch with the radio frequency field. The protons are organized into collections of about 100 million protons, which are called bunches. I will use this word a lot. It should be 100 billion protons are called uh, bunches, about 100 million, not exact 100 million. Uh, they sit in the trough of the RO field. Uh, next slide. These bunches have a size fixed by the wavelength of RO field. Uh, and are separated from one another. The RF field at the LHC has a frequency of about 400 megahertz, corresponding to a wavelength of about 0.75 meters. Uh, no proton exists in isolation at LHC. It is always within its bunch. Uh, the wavelength of the RF field is around 0.75 meter, right? So it is the length of the bunch, size of the bunch. Next slide. Uh, uh, here we are, I, I have shown you the LSCP collision layer. What happens before the electrons come into the LHC? Once separated into bunches, the protons are sent through a series of accelerators until they reach the main LHC. The first accelerator is LINAC2, which is a linear accelerator. It consists of dipole electric field arranged in a line which accelerate, which accelerate the protons. These electric fields push and pull the proton bunches and are accelerating them to an energy of about 50, 50 million electron volts. The bunches are then sent into the booster. It is a circular accelerator uh, and here the proton bunch is uh, uh, gains energy uh, about to 1.4 giga electron volts. After the booster, the proton bunch are accelerated to 25 giga electron volts by the proton synchrotron and then to 450, gillion, 450 giga electron volts by the super proton synchrotron. After the SPS, the protons are injected into LHC ring and then accelerated to the maximum energy of 13 to 14 tera electron volts. To maintain that energy and to keep protons in the LHC ring, it requires continuous energy input, both in magnetic field. Uh, next slide. As a circular accelerator, LHC is a circular accelerator, right? As a circular accelerator, the proton bunches can be sent around the circle many times. 
till we reach the desired energy this is an advantage with respect to a linear collider because we get only one shot at linear collider but here in circular accelerator or collider we can make the uh, proton punches go around the loop as many time as we want but even with a constant speed protons traveling in a circle or accelerating and therefore emit electromagnetic radiation called synchrotron radiation a circular accelerator must input enough energy to both speed up the protons and maintain the energy as they lose energy continuously through synchrotron radiation this is one of the main limitations on the energy to which circular accelerators can reach uh, next slide the value of synchrotron radiation for lhc is about 40 million electron volts per second it is given in power uh, accord accounting for all protons accelerated at the lhc the power emitted from synchrotron radiation is about a kilowatt which is not very much uh, as we compare to the total electronic uh, electricity budget of the lhc in addition to synchrotron loss from the protons traveling in a circle we have to keep the protons the lhc ring right uh, normally proton which travels in a straight line but we have to make it go around the loop this requires thousands of super conducting electromagnets that bend the part of the protons without affecting their kinetic energy the strength of the magnetic field that is required is given by the second equation v is equal to p by q r Uh, p is the momentum q is the charge and r is the radius of lhc next slide now the protons are traveling in lhc ring at their maximum energy we need to collide them the two counter rotating beams uh, remember there are two counter rotating beams of proton bunch one proton ring and another proton ring or uh, there are two proton bunch in the same lhc and a uh, count they are in counter rotating and they collide at specific location around lhc ring they collide at the place of the detectors however even though bunches consist of billions of protons proton is small and the vast majority of the volume of a bunch is empty space the volume of a proton bunch is 10 to the power minus 4 cubic meter while the total volume of the bunch occupied by 100 billion proton is only about 10 to the power 37 cubic meter the volume of empty space is more than 30 orders of magnitude larger than the volume of the protons this makes it extremely challenging for any of the protons to interact or collide next slide to improve the likelihood of collision or uh, interaction we need to make the beam volume much smaller this is accomplished at lhc by quadrupole focusing magnets located around the collision points uh, i will in the forthcoming slides i will show you how quadrupole magnetic field lines are uh, the bunch can be focused in top bottom left right regions by stacking a series of quadrupole magnets that are rotated 90 degrees from one another after using this uh, uh, quadrupole magnets the volume of the bunch is 10 to the power minus 8 cubic meters without the quadrupole magnets it will be around 10 to the power minus 4 and now it's 10 to the power minus 8 but still the volume of the proton is 10 to the power minus 37 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 8 seems like a very small change but it makes a huge deal only around this at uh, 10 to the power minus e we can get few collisions uh, next slide this is the quadrupole magnetic field you get this is how the proton bunch is compressed okay next slide now let's talk about what happens after we have accelerated and we after we have shrunk the we have compressed the proton bunch now we have to collide now let's talk about that once the proton beams have been accelerated to their maximum energy which is around 13 to 14 tera electron volts and focused at the collision point they are collided which just means that two opposite traveling bunches are passed through one another 
I told you there are two bunches, right? They pass through one another. When two protons collide, they exchange a significantly large amount of momentum. They explode into a shower of particles emanating from the collision point. Just imagine two paint balls and they are striking at a very high speed. The scene would be magnificent, right? Like that, we have a shower of particles uh, from the collision point. The dynamics of what happened at the moment of the proton collision is imprinted on this finite state particles. Through energy and momentum conservation, through angular momentum conservation or through charge conservation, we can see what those final not actually going to message the angular momentum. We are we will be calculating the angular momentum here because uh, observing or observing the calculating the angular momentum from transversal energy and momentum. Next slide. At a particle physics detector, we are able to measure many particle properties, but many others we don't even try to measure. For example, measuring energy and momentum are relatively easy. Electric charge is also relatively easy to measure. But angular momentum or spin on the other hand is not easy or convenient to measure. So we don't design our detectors to be sensitive to spin. But spin leaves, it, leaves its mark through energy and momentum conservation. So we will be able to infer spin from other measurements. Next slide. Let's move on to how to measure particle properties from the various components of the detector. We will work with a much simplified picture which Atlas and CMS are to both equivalent. Imagine an onion or a rings of a goat or anything that looks like concentric circles. Uh, the experiment consists of many layers, each of which measures particular properties or is sensitive to particular properties. The innermost uh, in innermost circle will be the tracking system, and the uh, next circle will be calorimeter, and then the next circle will be muon system, uh, which is shown in this picture. Next slide. Detectors like Atlas or CMS are often referred to as four pi hermetic detectors because they cap produced from proton collision through 4 pi steradians of a sphere as best as possible. 4 pi steradians can be taken as solid angle, but this task is impossible because there is uh, at least the proton beams must come in somewhere and cables have to go somewhere, right? So 4 pi steradian here is impossible, but however the coverage is otherwise exceptional, except the uh, way for pro uh, proton bunch going, other side we are totally covering it with detectors, so the coverage is exceptional. So next slide. Immediately outside the region of collision point and proton beam is the tracking system. The, tra the tracking system is the first of many layers of Atlas or CMS. The tracking system consists of millions of individual channels that respond when the charged particle hits them. These consist of silicon or gas that ionizes when a high energy particle with charge passes through. This ionization is recorded at numerous points along the trajectory of the charged particles and traces of the track of the charged particles. When, you are, uh, we, when we have to measure trajectory, only around three layers is three layers is enough. There are about 30 layers for tracking system. Only in about three layers, we can uh, find the trajectory of the particle. Observing these tracks provides information about the direction of charged particles, but by itself, it doesn't provide information about the energy of the particles because just with the trajectory, we can't do much. So let's see what we need for making this uh, for making this useful. Next slide. Tracker exceptionally useful is that it is embedded in a solenoidal magnetic field. The solenoidal field points parallel to the 
proton beam which is along x direction z direction the parallel right so it is along z direction and so charged particle trajectories are affected by the magnitude of their charge and momentum p we are using solenoidal magnetic field here and i told you earlier is the tracking system acts to particles with charge what happens when the charge is in a magnetic field it interacts with the magnetic field right so it is basic rule standard physics that is uh, using here uh, only the component of the momentum perpendicular to the magnetic field which is again in x is a direction is affected by the magnetic field because of the solenoidal magnet the tracking system is sensitive to both the charge and the transverse momentum of particles uh, just see can not the momentum uh, for momentum in the x direction px is sin times phi of transverse momentum where phi is the azimuthal or uh, it uh, it could be also the pseudo parity which is the delta the beam the angle between the beam the bunch and the final state beam okay next slide detector components tracking systems the tracking systems consist of many layers i told you right it's about 30 layers curvature can be minimum with 3 the trajectory also can be measured with just 3 three, uh, three layers but we have 30 layers importantly it is the curvature there is a difference between curvature and radius of the curvature curvature is the, uh, uh, what can we say it's like it's like it's not like a circle it's the path of the trajectory of the particle radius of the curvature we know uh, the curvature is inversely proportional to the radius of curvature which is inversely proportional to the transverse momentum we can see in this equation uh, the uncertainty in the uncertainty in the curvature is proportional to the uncertainty in the uh, and we can see from here the uncertainty on the measurement of momentum in this way increases with increasing momentum which is the which is directly proportional to the square of transverse momentum next slide the next layer of the particle detector onion is calorimetry we have moved along from first peel we have just peeled the onion from inside uh we have now moving to the second layer this is uh, uh, the calorimeter calorimetry is happens the electromagnetic and hadronic calorimeters have the same basic function but are designed to be sensitive to different types of particles the calorimeters are designed to stop the particles and have them explode all of the energy into individualized cells of the calorimeter the electromagnetic and hadronic calorimeters are sensitive to electromagnetic and hadronic radiation in particular the electromagnetic calorimeter stops electrons and photons and also low mass particles that interacts via electromagnetism next slide the most important way that the electromagnetic calorimeter stops high energy electron and proton is through bremsstrahlung it is the process by which an electron emits a photon which decreases its energy imagine an electron has very high energy and then it uh, emits a photon and then the electron comes to lower energy in a similar way a photon can sp split into electron positron pair pair production uh, and each resulting particle has less energy than the initial photon next slide. at atlas for example the electromagnetic calorimeter consists of lead plates immersed in liquid argon the liquid argon ionizes here we are talking about uh, electromagnetic uh, calorimetry right here we, we, the radiation from the particle is not going to act on the atomic nuclei it's going to act, act on the uh, electrons which is present in the orbit the liquid argon is ionized when a low energy particle when a low energy uh, is is exploded i have mentioned exploded right in the previous i have mentioned 
the particles are exploded and then the energy of energy is on when pressure the lead plates have strong stopping power for more energetic particles together with argon they form the electromagnetic collider and stop nearly all electrons and photons created in collision the electrons and photons hit the lead plates and then the energy from that explosion uh, ionizes the liquid argon from which we have we take the measurements for energies next slide the hadronic calorimeter the hadronic calorimeter acts in much the same way as the electromagnetic calorimeter however it must stop particles with a much higher mass than electrons hadrons like pions interact more strongly with atomic nuclei in electromagnetic Uh, calorimetry we saw particles uh, uh, interacting with the electron electron of the atom but here the particle directly uh, interacts with the atomic nuclei as such their interactions are more complicated to understand but the same basic principles are at work hadron passes through a material and loses energy or uh, by inelastic collision explosion with atomic nuclei next slide the hadronic calorimeter consists mostly of iron for stopping and plastic scintillators are used to measure energies of hadrons in electromagnetic calorimeter uh, lead is used for stopping right here iron is used for stopping and plastic scintillators are used to measure uh, energies of hadrons now i will tell uh, why lead and iron are chosen for lead uh, the lead is chosen chosen because it has the least radiation length radiation length is like where electron cannot pass through if, if the length is lower the electron cannot pass through it must uh, collide it must collide if the length is larger radiation length is larger then electron can pass through so we chose a element with has the least radiation length so we chose uh, lead for here we chose iron because it has the least nuclear interaction length for that its radiation length here it is nuclear interaction length electromagnetic calorimeters measure the energy of electrons and photons as they interact with matter matter hadronic calorimeters sample the energy of hadrons particles that contain quarks such as protons and neutrons as they interact with atomic nuclei electromagnetic uh, calorimeters acts with uh, uh, out, orbital electrons whereas hadronic calorimeters interact directly with the atomic nuclei calorimeters can stop most known particles except muons and neutrinos next slide muon system at both atlas and cms outside of the hadronic calorimeter there is a muon detection system at atlas it consists of detectors for tracking in a high tesla toroidal magnetic field cms by contrast uses a high tesla solenoidal magnet to bend muons the the toroidal magnetic field you know right toroidal magnet both have a different shapes but uh, it can be it's not equal but can be equivalent the value of the magnetic field we are getting is equivalent cms is extremely dense which ensures that the calorimetry can stop particles and the muon system significantly bends the trajectory of muon though much smaller than atlas the weight of cms is more than twice that of atlas here what i'm trying to say is um, muon muon has a charge of the electron but it's around 200 times heavier than not 200 times or 12 times or oh, forgot uh, it is heavier than electron but it has the same charge as electron the muon is going through a magnetic field here there are toroidal magnet or solenoidal magnet right it's here again the charge in part right from that uh, interaction we measure its uh, momentum next slide 
I have showed you here the muon detector. In the muon detector, the muon has the trajectory is changed, right? It is due to the magnetic field. We can see the change in the trajectory of the muon here. Next. Now let's come to the. That's all. After muon detection, we are the circuits and the layer we have is only for what uh, the electronic system of the uh, atlas and uh, cms but we don't have a uh, any separate detectors for observing neutrino in the lhc the tracker the tracking system calorimetry and muon system detects and measure the momentum of almost all detector stable particles detector stable particles are particles which have a uh, higher lifetime some particles annihilate after they have born itself but some particles some hadrons and uh, electrons photons can uh, has higher lifetime and this exists longer so the detector can detect them but there is one class of particles that is detector stable but cannot be measured they are neutrinos like photons neutrinos are electrically neutral and have very small mass unfortunately neutrinos interact incredibly weakly with matters and so that vast majority of the time pass right through the detector components we are not even trying to measure the neutrinos here because it can, it does not react with matter so we are not even trying to measure the neutrino but it doesn't mean we can observe the neutrino uh, next slide but we can indirectly calculate neutrinos while taking account all the transfers energy happening inside there will be a small gap in the measurements which are mostly neutrino they are not neutrino which are mostly neutrinos okay uh, okay that's it i will hand over to pugal um thank you uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, setup amal raj uh, yes. uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, the stuff that happens after uh, collision um, and uh, what mostly follows is a very hand wavy version of uh, statistics. So this is uh, more of a take and use uh, method of uh, doing the rigorous one. So this is more of an overview uh, than uh, that is something to be uh, you know, uh, taken seriously. All right. Without further ado, let's uh, get started. Uh, I'm going to first talk about uh, the statistical analysis, and then go into maybe one or two uh, examples of uh, what's happened in the field uh, so far. Um, so first of all, let's try to understand uncertainties a bit. Uh, there's two different types of uncertainties that we care about in this context. Uh, systemic uh, systemic uncertainties. Uh, well, it, it systemic uh, basically means uh, you know, your uh, measurement uh, device is uh, at fault, or uh, your uh, technique. Uh, so it's it's uh, to be putting it short, it's uh, inherent uh, in uh, your uh, device or a technique, and uh, I think that's usually calculatable, and you can sort of play around with it. Uh, so. And, and in fact, it's it's quite difficult uh, to determine these uh, systematic uncertainty. I mean, if your if your system is something like a ruler uh, or something, then uh, all you need to do is just a least count. But uh, since we just looked at the sheer complexity of uh, you know the, the system that we're talking about, which are colliders with you know stories and stuff, uh, you know electronics, it's quite difficult to calculate. Uh, but uh, th that's why we there's always error bars, and that's why we do so many the, the same experiment a couple of times, and there's uh, we oftentimes uh, wait for the data for years before we can even uh, talk about uh, things. Uh, and in fact, they are important to model things correctly. And uh, but we will shift our focus to something else that we can talk about in a. Uh, much simpler uh, mathematical setting, and uh, that is nothing but uh, 
statistical uh, uncertainties. Um, well, actually, before you like, if, before I even uh, go there, let me uh, head back and uh, give a little bit of a intro as to what happens post collision. So, one thing that uh, I forgot to mention was uh, that there's forty uh, million uh, bunches uh, per second at the uh, LHC. And we, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> LC. So this is quite uh, maddening because uh, when we're thinking in terms of data, we need to uh, store it, uh, process it, um, and uh, make it available for everyone. This is uh, a difficult task. It's actually an impossible task. You, there's simply no method of, uh, holding all of this information uh, together in a singular place or even distributing it. Uh, in fact, it, it's, it's around 40 uh, terabytes uh, per second of data. Uh, so instead, uh, we employ various methods. Uh, so the, one of the most basic ones is just uh, having a distributed uh, set of servers or uh, computing. Uh, here, uh, there are some interesting uh, avenues to explore. Obviously, there's the hardware aspect of it. The software aspect, uh, maybe we'll see this uh, sometime later on. This is the uh, oops, this is the software structure uh, that uh, of the software that we use to sort of encode our data. It's called uh, MongoDB. Uh, it, it's it's a uh, non-relational uh, database uh, structure that uh, actually makes things a bit more uh, tad bit easier uh, to sort of query and use. Uh, for scientists all across the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the World Wide Web, uh, the internet was basically founded in CERN so that uh, people can share all of this data. But again, uh, how do I uh, store all of this data? Well, first of all, we don't store all of it. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, we only store events that are uh, quote unquote interesting. Uh, but even before we go in, only considering partial portions of data, we can ask ourselves, can we reduce this amount? Is there any way we can? Uh, well, the answer to that is kind of uh, no, because uh, although you have uh, 100, million, 100 million protons in a bunch uh, and you collide them, you really need to have a, uh, a high uh, frequency of events, or in this case, events refer to uh, co collision and uh, particles sort of going into different sets of uh, jets and being uh, hitting the detectors. Uh, the reason we require these high frequencies, despite the fact that you, you know a bunch has a lot of protons and we have a lot of bunches in the rings, most of it is just empty space, and uh, and even the parts that are not empty space can may not produce the events that we're looking for. Uh, Things are very, and the events we're looking for are oftentimes very elusive, especially at the LHC, because we're kind of maxing out our limits. So we had, and, and every uh, next generation uh, collider has the same story, literally, in that case. Uh, so that's why we can't reduce the number of events uh, or this uh, raw amount of data that's coming. So we have to instead uh, try to look at uh, interesting things. And what do I mean by interesting things? But uh, we have these things that are called triggers. Uh, well, to put it in simple electronics lingo, it's sort of like a filter. So you can think of this as a filter. But what does it filter? Uh, well, uh, for, for, uh, for example, uh, it really depends on what we're looking at. So, so a good example would be, so if you have a muon, uh, your uh, transverse uh, momentum uh, is around, I think, uh, around 1 GeV, transfers momentum at uh, 1 GeV. Uh, the thing is, I'm only going to look at, if I care about muons, this is the only thing that I'm looking for. Or it's one of the few things that I'm looking for. The rest of the thing, I don't give a shit. Oops, I don't, I don't care. Um, so the, despite the fact that there are a gazillion amount of uh, events that happen, I only care about uh, one to two percent of them because only one to two percent of them fall fall into this range. And these so-called triggers, which are electronic circuits, 
uh, filter this out and they just capture the events that are necessary and they store them quickly. So once they're stored, uh, you know, you, you can go back to your cloud computing and RTP image structure and after that people start uh, exploring them. So now we can finally talk about uh, statistical uh, uncertainties and what they mean. So, well, th this is actually a type of uncertainty that's due to the finite nature of measurements. Uh, what do I mean by that? So obviously, if you have a normalized uh, probability, uh, probability uh, uh, distribution p of x um, over a range dx, and if I actually integrate it, or if I if it's a discrete one, if I sum over it, it just needs to go to one. Uh, there's nothing uh, non-trivial about this. But uh, if I were to take uh, you know uh, a subdomain uh, a uh, comma b, then uh, this can lie between 0 and 1. Uh, and this is where there's a sense of an uh, deviation from uh, the true result by a certain uh, defined, well-defined amount. Uh, and this is where things get tricky. Because usually, even when we're doing theory, the given uh, thing in quantum mechanics, we don't talk about this. This is ridiculous. Uh, so, but when we are doing experiments, oftentimes we are, no matter how many times I repeat the same event over and over and over again, I can only approach infinity. I cannot probably uh, not attain it. So a good example uh, would be uh, this thing called uh, MLL. Uh, so actually, what happens uh, in this uh, particular thing is, uh, you you get an electron positron pair uh, from a uh, proton uh, collision, so you can your end result is uh, you know so obviously your uh, this this mass is invariant. We know what we're looking at. Uh, this is from theoretical observations and you know individually these things we know exactly what we're expecting. Uh, so this. So pretty much any value, trivially speaking, any value above uh, zero can satisfy this. But obviously, there's a uh, upper bound uh, on this uh, as well, right? So, the, but our goal is uh, not to talk about this one specific mass, but we know that we're expecting this. But rather, we want to talk about uh, the distribution uh, behind this because. Uh, that is uh, what would uh, tell us later on if there's something, uh, uh, you know, f fuzzy happening uh, at like a new particle or uh, something more interesting. So we, we really care about distributions and we will be going through a few of them just to uh, finally understand uh, the physics behind it. It, it. It's a long road, uh, but bear with me on this. So first of all, uh, when we're trying to uh, look at we try to do something uh, that's called a uh, bin approximation. So first of all, we, we, we put, to put it in just plain physics speak, we uh, construct the, the, the distribution and we compare this to predictions and draw conclusions about it. But here, obviously, we don't have an infinite number of measurements. And this is a way for us to approximate from finite sets of events uh, something that is closer to the true uh, the true distribution. Obviously, uh, this needn't be uh, the, 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 the true distribution, and this needn't be uh, the only way of getting to the true distribution. But this is rather uh, a good uh, example of what uh, is a way of getting to the true, uh, to the true description or the true, the true uh, distribution. Uh, and again, that, that's kind of that kind of applies to uh, everything that we're talking about here. We're, we've taken up the simplest examples. Uh, the simplest cases uh, to give uh, ourselves a little overview of what things go on, happen. Uh, so the first uh, step is to uh, approximate the probability distribution. And we do this by constructing a histogram uh, of events. And the, these are essentially, uh, if, if this is my entire domain, I'm essentially, at one time, I'm going to construct a subdomain of it. And these subdomains are called bins. Um, and uh, we collect more and more measurements, and we just fill these bins appropriately. And uh, we obviously this is uh, normalized 
um, as well just as the, the probability distribution uh, we expected it to be as well so we're trying to make this approach this guy uh, to put it simply but uh, since we're using bit approximation there are a few caveats and uh, what one thing is that uh, uh, okay first of all this is the uh, bin width and this is the uh, number of events uh, that uh, we are taking into consideration uh, and um, so yeah uh, again uh, we're going to keep collect uh, and uh, for every you know uh, subdomain that we or every bin that we consider we have to keep adding this factor and uh, that is why uh, you know your sum is not sum over n but it's rather with this uh, factor of bins because we've sort of constructed a histogram and a trying approach of uh, that uh, distribution and um, in fact uh, we can make this a little more precise uh, uh, this approximation can be made but uh, if we take the event where we sort of assume okay my number of events approaches infinity uh, and this would also mean the bin width goes to zero uh, or basically becomes a differential uh, then you do approach the true probability distribution but again this is an ideal case this isn't uh, uh, this is more of to, to to show us that okay we are on the sort of uh, right path and so on uh, but uh, what happens uh, if the NEV is uh, finite and what happens if the approximation in the histogram is actually kind of close to the true probability distribution uh, obviously it can be wrong but what happens if it is true uh, in that case uh, we would go through a few different uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to try to see how one sort of probability distribution leads to another and a little bit of statistics around that like means variances things that we've probably seen in high school but uh, what they mean in this uh, context as well so we'll actually start with uh, the binomial distribution shouldn't say expansion uh, apologies uh, well actually th this is actually kind of an answer to the previous question which is uh, what happens if the probability distribution uh, that we're expecting for the pin approximation is actually true then you do end up with a binomial uh, distribution and uh, obviously this comes with a uh, you know uh, assumption so my assumption is that not fact, but it's kind of each event is independent. Um, this is kind of uh, a big leap, uh, considering the fact that we're not talking about billiard balls, we're talking about actual particles, which can sort of interact with each other. Uh, but again, this is more of a simplifying uh, case. It's not a, it's not a really uh, big thing, but let just bear with me on this. Um, right. So if we do it, uh, then, uh, basically the measurement on one event, uh, actually has no bearing on the measurement of another event. Uh, that's more of a weaker, uh, version of the same assumption, but, uh, yes, again, that hope that is pretty obvious and we can see why that holds, uh, it just based on the measurement prospect. Um, so yes, uh, and the constants of each event, the observation of each event, uh, when uh, you sort of tabulate it, uh, it obviously will form a probability distribution as we've seen before, and this will be a random one. Uh, and if we want to say, look at the probability of, uh, with, of P of X within uh, a range DX, um, this, is, this is kind of what we end up with. Uh, and the, the, the thing is, this is telling me the opposite of this, but this is telling me what, uh, the probability of the event happening and this is telling me the probability of the event um, not uh, happening and uh, so on so this is something that we've i guess we've all seen in high school so this is just the binomial uh, uh distribution um and this is just the this is just nevck or n chooses k as uh, sometimes it's said so all it means is that uh, the number of ways to pick k events out of a set um nev so K is uh, a subset of, and this is, you can say choosing, 
and sometimes it is you don't have this bracket and you have this giant C. I don't know why. Um, so yes, uh, and, and and the and the reason uh, we do this is because uh, we try we are actually trying to find out the probability that k events or or n events or k events are near x, and that actually we need to choose k out of uh, the total, which is n e v, and multiply it by the probabilities that are uh, near uh, x and you know that are not near uh, that are not near x as well. So that's how we end up from here to here. So this is telling us the number of ways to choose things, and this is telling us uh, how you know how many events uh, k. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, the probability that events land near x. Yes. Um, and it's called the binomial uh, probability distribution because it actually follows from the expansion of the binomial expression. And uh, we are assuming that it's a normalized uh, distribution. Level. And in fact, we'll be assuming all of them are, are normalized distributions. They, they are uh, rather very trivial. I don't want to state it. You can find it in pretty much any stat book. Um, and actually, if we take, uh, we could sort of pause. Uh, uh, right back here, and uh, well, to, to be very specific, the binomial distribution tells us the, the distribution of the number of events in a given bin, in one particular bin, uh, and that is with a probability distribution p of x. We could stop here and do all of it, all of the whatever sort of analysis we want to do, but uh, we could actually. Uh, uh, distribution a lot uh, simpler and uh, that is what we're going to do. Hey, so, Paul, quick question. Yes, Chinmaya, hello. Hi, hi, equation 11, are you missing a factorial in the numerator? Oh yes, I forgot to put, yes. Oh no, wait, in the numerator, here? Of the okay. choosing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 sorry. Go. Yeah, just missed that one, yeah. Oops, all right. Um, Okay, may I? Anything else? No, no, thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, what we could do in this case is uh, just sort of take any v going to infinity, uh, as we, but with k being finite, uh, and we also assume that uh, p is less than one. So these are the three assumptions that we're going to make. So Putting out, maybe heading to infinity. K is finite, and oops, and P is very much less than one. And if we do this, uh, we actually end up with uh, something that's called the uh, Poisson distribution, and this is just a very uh, wonky way of getting. Oops, this should read. Heading to infinity. Um, so again, this is just uh, just same thing, the same thing, uh, but I'm just taking the limit, and uh, I've just worked out here. Okay, what happens if I take the limit of these uh, factorial terms, and then what happens if I again uh, take the limit of the term inside the bracket, and so on. Uh, so yeah, I end up with this guy right here, and this is the Poisson distribution. I uh, don't want to go into too much detail, uh, but it it is normalized, and uh, I'll go straight into what I really care about right now, which is uh, the mean and the expectation values. So uh, what happens uh, here is that the average number of the events here, which is this is the average, the expectation value would be any v times p, any v total number of events, p being the probability of one of them. Um, and its variance would be just uh, this guy. It's, it'll, it'll be the square of this, and yeah. And it has this interesting uh, relationship uh, over here. And why is this um, interesting? Because the this sort of is telling us that the average deviation from the mean, uh, I'm sorry, the average deviation is the standard deviation. But what this is telling us is, um, is in a loose sense, uh, 
that the more likely that there's they, that they are more likely uh, you're more likely to have large deviations within a small data set than a uh, large one and uh, as you get more data the deviations will uh, diminish and uh, and again if if you were just going to look at a curve i mean this is not the the poisson distribution obviously this is other one uh, i'll get to it but you know this is to just give you guys a picture uh, if we take this to be the mean the farther away it is from what you're expecting, the you know the less uh, less likely it is to be true or interesting and so on. Right? Again, uh, this is not a very uh, correct picture, but it's more of a loose one. And uh, I'll tell you why this is useful because there's something that actually uh, uh, in the community a few years back, uh, not very well versed with this, but just thought I'd mention it. Uh, this is called the diphoton excess uh, incident. It happened in 2015 to 2016 summer, I think. So uh, what actually happened was there was a small anomaly in the data uh, in, uh, that was from the LHC in 2015. And uh, people were thinking that uh, there was this weird uh, particle called the gamma. Uh, the, this is called the digamma, and it was this weird F. Um, it, and people kind of went bizarre. Uh, they, they, I mean, they kind of went nuts over this because uh, after a pretty long time, after I think 2012, there was finally something that was anomalous. Um, and uh, there were nearly 500 papers uh, within that gap uh, of what it could be. Uh, th this is despite the fact that uh, as we'll see later on, this event in 2015, uh, if I'm not wrong, had a 3.4 uh, sigma significance, which is, your, your golden standard is usually 5. Just keep this in mind. Uh, I'll get back to this. It was not 5, but it was 3.4. And people really went nuts over it. Uh, there was a lot of papers, uh, but the data set in 2016 uh, did not anomaly. There was uh, nothing there. Nothing. The, the the curve there had just uh, the the bump there had just sort of vanished. Uh, that that's kind of a and and, and it was attributed to just uh, statistical uh, fluctuations in the data, and the, the curve basically flattened out. And I mean, it's a it's a it's a lesson kind of worth remembering in my opinion because although and the the problem is we're not having uh, sometimes we either had too much data or. Uh, data not in our favor or data that is really bizarre and we don't know what to do and sometimes we just jump at it when we see something interesting and it, it can be a bad thing to do sometimes or it can be a good thing to do saying that you know okay this model or whatever with this digamma it can be rolled out uh, right now because of this loss of the thing all right um okay so let me dash to the rest of the stuff um, uh, box, a quick uh, comment. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a more uh, more significant result. It was a three point nine sigma result by oh, uh, by okay. Atlas. Three point four was the CMS result. Three point nine was the Atlas result. Okay. Didn't so it was that. higher than three point four actually. Okay. Well, what was the twenty sixteen one though? The twenty sixteen. Uh, I mean, the twenty sixteen didn't find this result. Yeah. I mean, it was not reproducible. That's the problem. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you I just be, wanted to comment. I just wanted to comment the three point nine result. It was uh, during the same time of two thousand fifteen. Yeah. Oh wait, during two twenty fifteen, I thought it came later. Yeah, I mean uh, both the detectors. I mean CMS and Atlas both detected this result. Uh, CMS gave a three point four sigma, and uh, Atlas was three point nine okay. sigma. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Um. Okay. Uh. Let me back to statistics uh once again i messed up a formula here uh, uh but uh, essentially there was this long uh way of taking a limit and uh you would get to this uh thing uh let me just uh, strike it off but essentially this is uh um this is yet another uh this is the Gaussian distribution um and this happens when we take any we heading to infinity um, and k is a continuous variable if you take it to be continuous 
uh, as you can uh, with, uh, and if you do this to the Poisson, you get this guy. Oops. Uh, again, this is uh, normalized, uh, and uh, well, actually, looking at this, look, looking at this is kind of uh, I mean, sorry, solving this is a little bizarre. Uh, if you if you sort of go through this, you'll get something that's called the error function. Don't want to say too much about it. Uh, you can look it up, but uh, essentially, this is what you get when you're trying to solve for it. But that's not the point. That's not what we're looking after. But the thing is, this is when you consider this case, uh, you, you arrive at a very interesting thing that's called the p-value, which is to say, what's the probability that there was a deviation uh, above the mean at some x uh, sigma, and you essentially get it by this uh, integral, and you end up with uh, this thing right here. And uh, p-values are a very in important commodity in particle physics. Uh, for example, this is the plot for the Higgs, and uh, this was collected from this particular process. It's the diphoton. Uh, I think it's the diphoton uh, emission from the Higgs. And uh, it took a while for the community to accept this, uh, but when the data was presented, it was, I think, 9, 4.9 sigma uh, by uh, CMS and Atlas. Uh, and usually, uh, and, and to just put this, uh, into a more uh, in, into a scale where we can actually imagine this. So a, a one sigma result is at the order of uh, zero point one six, which is to say, I have a zero point one six percent chance of it being a result uh, due to statistical fluctuations. And uh, two sigma, or let's say three sigma. Actually, three sigma would be around zero point zero one three and this, again, you're slowly going down the ladder, you're getting less likely things, and Phi Sigma is the standard that we're after, and Phi Sigma is uh, one, approximately one by 310 to the power minus seven. Yeah. So this is how likely that this whole thing was a, was just a statistical fluctuation, and you can see how all of the machinery was sort of built in so far was just to sort of arrive at this uh, one interesting thing. And uh, of course, as we saw earlier, sometimes you can jump at things or something. Sometimes things can seem hopeful. Again, you just have to wait for the data and always look, at, look after uh, this one particular thing. Um, and, and it's kind of an unofficial thing. It's not nobody really people know it by default. No, it's not written out or so, but it's just there. So, if your uh, this, if your uh, observations are uh, four point nine sigma away from the quote unquote null hypothesis, which is to say that it was just a random one, then you've got a discovery. Otherwise, not so. Uh, so yeah, I stop with this uh, over here and uh, few questions.